like what what I it's a it's a timetable thing. Yeah. Spring. But why is that important? Why why, why do why tell why us because the feeding of the 4,000, which is recorded in Matthew, after the 5,000, he tells them to sit on the ground. So here you experienced the feeding of the 5,000. Here you're experiencing the feeding of the 4,000, and you're reacting the same way. How are we going to do this? Just a few months later, why wouldn't you, hey, we went through this. This is no problem. When are you going to learn, guys? And it is interesting that there are two different groups. Right? The feeding of 5,000 was the Jews. The feeding of 4,000 yep. was the Gentiles, the, the pagans. Uh, so that, that puts that in the sense of, from a disciple yep. perspective. Yep. I like that. We're like that, aren't we? We, yeah. we just don't learn. Well, thank you for being here. I want you to turn to uh, Acts chapter 2. Uh, again, uh, anything we need to discuss about what's gone on so far this morning? Anything you want to bring up? Uh, anything we can clarify? Anything uh, we're open to you? I'm excited about what I get to share with you today. Uh, we're looking at the Pentecost event uh, in relationship to uh, the uh, outpouring of the Spirit of God in verse 1 through 4. And we uh, divided this into uh, chapter 2, verse 1 is the context in which this takes place. Chapter 2, verse 2 and 3 are the content of the event itself. And chapter 2, verse 4 is the consequence. And uh, as Wayne is coming in, I, I wanted to discuss with you again, we, we may have left a wrong impression yesterday. Uh, I, I may have le left a wrong impression yesterday. Uh, I am convinced, and I've heard this, and we talked a little bit about it yesterday, so this is a clarification of, of, what, of what we said yesterday. Uh, that the miracle of speaking in tongues, the, the language, uh, by, by the way, there's 15 different dialects. Uh, he lists them in verse 9 uh, down through verse uh, uh, tw 11. Uh, there's 15 of them, uh, different nationalities and different dialects that were represented. And each man heard, according to verse 6, uh, they were confused because everyone heard them speak in his own language. So there's been this proposal uh, by many uh, that it was a hearing miracle, not a speaking miracle. And in fact, in verse 11, you'll get, it says, we hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So that it was a hearing miracle. The miracle took place in the hearing of the individual and the disciples were not actually speaking 15 different languages. The thing that corrects that, and I don't know why I didn't say this yesterday, but Somehow it didn't come together. I, I'm old, that's why. And in verse 4, uh, if you look, go back to verse 4, they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterances. So there's no way you can come into this event biblically and legitimately say it was hearing miracle when there was... The scripture says they actually spoke with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So that settles that as far as I'm concerned. So I didn't want to leave that just hanging in the air for whoever might be. Okay. Um, we want to go today to the content again. So we looked at the context, and the context, of course, of the whole event is found in the day of Pentecost, which is not a label for the event. It is a planting of the event in the midst of the Jewish festivals. And Pentecost was the last of the Jewish festivals 
which was the celebration of the harvest being brought in and the celebration of the harvest in the spiritual sense for the Jew was the law. So from the Passover uh, in Egypt when they were turned loose to Pentecost to the giving of the law on Mount Sinai was a slot of 50 days. So from the Passover to the celebration of the feast day of Pentecost, it was 50. Pentecost means 50. So they, out, they come out of Egypt as slaves. They journey and end up at Mount Sinai 50 days later receiving the law. So what he's giving now is we are moving from the law structure to the indwelling presence of God structure. So God is actually indwelling the human being. So the day of Pentecost where they received the law as the focus of their lives has now been changed to the focus on the indwelling presence of God in the intimacy and merger with your life, which is very, very significant. So that's the context in which this event takes place, the day of Pentecost, feast day. Then he moves to this content, and we dealt with verse 2 yesterday. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Now, we discussed the idea of sound, just a little review, sussed the idea of sound, and there is no as a rushing mighty wind. And you'll note there was no rushing mighty wind. If there had been, we would explain it away and say, oh, tornado came. And that would have explained the whole thing away. But there's the sound without the wind, which can't be explained away. And the emphasis of the sound idea is the idea of communication. And everywhere you go in the book of Acts in relationship to the filling of the Holy Spirit, every time the idea of the Holy Spirit coming and filling anybody, there is always the idea of communication, speaking, witnessing. Every single, every single reference to the filling of the Spirit has some kind of connection to the idea of communication. So, obviously, what's going on is God is desperately, desperately wanting to communicate with us. And uh, we were discovered that the word uh, from, it's a sound from, which is meaning inside. It originates within heaven, meaning it literally comes from inside of God. So the picture is God has reached down in his throat, grabbed a hold of his inner heart, pulled it out, and in, that's what has come to indwell us. This is not a, a circumference thing. This is not he reached out and grabbed an angel, and the angel is, uh, is indwelling us. This is the actual nature heart of God that has come to live within the human life. Uh, we discovered the Greek word for sound is echoes, which is the idea where we get our word echo, which means we don't originate it. So we are to be a dispenser, an echo of the heart of God. Uh, so we are not... We are not imitations. We are not WWJD. We are a people who have literally been filled with the essence of the heart and nature of God and have so merged with that that his mind and our mind, his heart and our heart, his will and our will have become one and we are functioning as a new creature. And that is just a startling uh, concept uh, that here I am, here he is, and now my, I am my sinfulness and my helplessness. He and his overwhelming nature and heart have literally come and merged with me until we have become a new creature. He's not changed me, and I'm saying, thank you, I'm different. I've got more information than I had. I've got new ideas. I've developed a new philosophy. I have a new perspective. Thank you, Jesus. No, he has come, and in merging with me, I have become this new person. I can't be this on my own. He isn't this on his own. But together, we form this new thing. This language in the New Testament is so radical that we call this uh, in relationship to this, that we call it born again. We call it new creature. We call it death to self, 
res raised from the dead kind of stuff. So it's a brand new intimate involvement with God that produces something brand new that's not been in existence before. And that's this event, the sound from heaven. Today, we want to go to verse 3, which is the second, and all of this is imagery, you understand. And we're going to the second imagery that he gives, trying to describe this undescribable involvement with God that has now come to the human life on this new level. And he describes it like this in verse 3. Then there appeared to them divided tongues as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. Now, divided tongues as of fire. Recognize the fact again, there was no fire. I was there when the fire fell. Sorry, there was no fire. It's imagery. And the imagery, of course, is the fire all through the Old Testament is God. Pillar of fire by night, he led us. The fire was constantly burning on the sacrifice altar in the temple, in the, ta in, in the tabernacle of the temple. Uh, it, it's the fire thing always represents this, this burning presence of God himself. So obviously what's come to indwell me is the burning presence of God himself, this person. And I know we, we've said this a thousand times and probably said it even this week. But it is, it, it, uh, I, I think that there is a tendency in the evangelical church in our thought process to kind of, kind of settle this down to influence. That God is influencing me. Uh, God is giving me a new perspective. Uh, hey, I've taken on a new belief system that Christianity is that, that level. Well, I've learned to push away hate, and now I'm loving because what the world needs is love, more love. So I've got that now. So it, it's, it's that kind of, we, we've dumbed it down. When what he's talking about is the living person of God, his mind, his will, and his emotion, three parts of personality, and again, God may, can be more than that. He can be anything he wants to be. But as revealed in the scriptures, he is this living, functioning person. And that person who has a mind, that person who has emotions, that person who has feeling, God as revealed in the scriptures is a person. And that person has come and moved through the pores of my skin and has gotten inside my very being. And I have two people, two personalities living inside my flesh who have merged together and literally formed one entity. The opposite of this is demon possession. What is demon possession? An entity, person entity called demon has come and gotten inside of a person and that person likes things they wouldn't normally like. I mean, there's evil, but then this is woe. I mean, everybody hates, I got that, that sin but then there's the guy that kills little kittens. I mean, that's, everybody sees that as abnormal. Why is he that way? A demonic thing. He's merged. There's, this is the opposite of that. I'm not demon possessed, I'm Jesus possessed. And I love things that I wouldn't normally have loved. And I act in ways I wouldn't normally have acted. Why? I'm this new person. <laughs> That's phenomenal, isn't it? <laughs> isn't that phenomenal? Mercy. Okay, so that's what he's talking about here. Now, the imagery of that, God as the fire coming to live within you, is given to you in the divided tongues. Now, the old King James uh, says it's the cloven tongues, which I thought was something that cows ate, but I guess that wasn't true. So, the actual Greek word for divided means separated, obviously. 
So there's a separation going on. So here's the imagery. Now we're talking about content of the event. Here's the imagery of you being filled with the Spirit that is coming from the Scriptures. There is this object that comes into the room. And this object that comes into the room begins to break up into pieces. And it's as of fire. So it's a flame. Hey, visualize this any way you want to. It's imagery. He's trying to describe something you can't describe. Was there an actual flame that came into the building? I doubt it. But he's describing something you can't describe. So here's this imagery. Here's this object that comes into the room. And it breaks into 120 pieces. And one piece went over and sat on every single individual. Every single individual had one piece of the object sitting on them. That's the imagery. Now, that imagery compared to the content of verse 2 gives you two different pictures. For he says in verse 2, suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. It filled the whole house. This is, it broke up and one sat on each of them. So in verse 2, you've got corporate filling. In verse 3, you've got individual filling. So in the imagery, he covers all the bases. Corporate filling, imagery filling, or individual filling. Now, I've always wanted to be in a place, and I've held a lot of revivals and prayed every single time in every one of those revivals that it would take place. Because I've always wanted to be in a place where there was a corporate filling. Whew, wouldn't that be great? Can you imagine a, a church literally jam-packed with people? And on a Sunday morning when every, it's just jam-packed, God just hits that place and just corporately fills everybody. And everybody goes, whoa. And they never get over it. That would be phenomenal. And I pray for that. I want that. I desire that. And when we have revivals, we pray that there, there would be a corporate filling that week, that everybody would come and just somehow God would just take us all and just, just wrap his arm around the entire body of Christ represented in that place. And he would just fill us all. And we would all just quake in our boots. And we would have such a powerful, powerful service that we wouldn't even have any singing. Oh, no, it's preaching. We didn't have any preaching. <laughs> Got it backwards. <laughs> that would be phenomenal. Was a joke. <laughs> that would be phenomenal, wouldn't it? But to tell you the truth, folks, I have never in all these years ever been where I considered a corporate filling taking place that was equal to this. Been in some good services. But I've never had a corporate filling where I went out and a, a filling that I said, wow, that was never have, never have. And then you begin to analyze, well, why haven't we? And we probably shouldn't get into that. Well, we didn't pray enough. Well, we didn't this enough. We didn't that. And, and, and somebody in this corporate filling, there's somebody in here that is probably sinful and full of evil and isn't willing to surrender. And because of them, we didn't have a corporate filling. And what we need to do is find out who it is. And get rid of them. <laughs> so we get rid of them. And then, well, it still doesn't happen. Well, who is it now? And we get rid of you. And then we get rid of you. And then we get rid of you. And then we get... And finally, we're down to my, myself and my wife. And I know it isn't me. <laughs> Do you see where that goes? Man, you're in trouble on that one. So I've given up on that. Sincerely, I tell you, I, I've quit that in my head, in my, well, who is it? I've, I've quit that stuff. Who didn't pray enough? Who didn't? I, hey, I've quit that. 
I'm, I'm, I'm a long time ago. I'm done with that. And I'm not, all I know is I can move into verse 3 and I can get the individual filling. And man, I'm going to burn, brother. I'm going to burn. And hey, whatever you do, whatever you don't do, that's your business. You can sit there dead or in a doornail, but I'm going to burn. See, you can, you can relax and do, do your thing, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go after Jesus. See, I'm, see the, the weight of this thing is in verse 3 as we move from some kind of corporate thing where the whole church is involved to this intimate oneness with God where I literally become filled with him and the imagery is that he literally comes and sat on them. Now let's discuss that because that seems to be the key to the imagery. He sat. Now folks, out of all the words, think about this, out of all the words that Luke could have used to try to describe this undescribable coming of the Holy Spirit within the human being, why would he use this word, sat? And out of all the words that are a part or give imagery to the sitting idea, he specifies, if you go to the Greek, he specifies this one word. It's used 46 times in the New Testament, which is quite a few, but it's not the normal word for sit. In other words, you come in the door of the sanctuary, you come up to the front seat, you pop yourself in the seat, and you sit there. That's not this. That's not this word. Uh, there is the word that's used in the uh, vine and the branch. I'm the vine, you're the branch. And, uh, and the word abide is used, what, nine times, I think. The word abide is used. Uh, whereas the, it's the resting idea. It's the remaining idea. It's the, it's the, it, but that's, that's not this word. See, out of all the words that he could have used for the description of the indwelling, the coming, the merging with God and man in one, in one being, he picks this word out. And this word, yeah, it has the sitting idea, but this word has a tone about it that every single time, every single time, exclusively, every single time, it's when it's used with this word. In other words, it's not most of the time, it's not, it's not a lot of the times, it's every time this word shows up, there's this tone that is connected to the word. And the tone is always this, it points to a person of great authority, a person of great authority, probably should write this down, a person of great authority. Authority. And that person sits on or in a place of authority. So every time, <clears throat> I'm trying to tell you, this, this Greek word used 46 times, not the normal word for sit. And every time it's used, it's describing a person of great authority who's sitting in a place of great authority. Every single time. Uh, let me give you some examples. Uh, Jesus, great multitudes out there and his disciples. And Jesus gathers his disciples together on the mount. The crowd is probably there. But Jesus has gathered his disciples together. And it says, he sat down and gave them the Sermon on the Mount. And it uses this word, Matthew chapter 5, verse 1, to describe Jesus sitting in a place of authority, describing the coming, the kingdom, the new level that he is introducing to them. This is the word to choose. Uh, let me give you another example. Uh, another example is, uh, oh, the two boys, the two uh, brothers, 
who are, uh, who are wanting the right hand and the left hand position. They get their mommy involved in it because the, uh, this, this mother is there as Jesus' aunt and these boys are cousins to Christ. So they come and she comes to Jesus. This is his aunt coming to Jesus saying, would you give the right hand and left hand position in the coming kingdom to my boys? Will you let them sit at your right hand? This is the word that's used. It's a place of authority. It's a person of great authority sitting in a place of great authority. That's the word that's used. Let me give you another. Uh, Jesus is describing in Matthew chapter 23, he's preached his final preached message. And in chapter 23 of Matthew, he talks about, he gives the seven woes to the Pharisees, scribes and Pharisees. And in, in that process, right at the beginning, he discusses the idea that don't be like the scribes and the Pharisees because they desire to sit. How does he say it? Sit in, uh, well, let me read it to you. Uh, <clears throat> here's what it says. The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. It was a chair that was up in front of the, uh, in, in the, in the synagogue or the temple. And whenever you read the law, the person of authority reading the law, he sat in that chair and they call it Moses' seat. Again, this word is used. So it's a person of great authority sitting in a place of great authority. Now, you can find that all over the book of Acts. He uses this word all the time. For instance, in Acts chapter 10, uh, Paul is drug in before Herod, and it says Herod was arrayed in royal apparel and sat on his throne. That word. Um, Acts chapter 25, Festus. Paul is brought in before the king Festus. And Festus is sitting, it says, on the place of authority. Again, that word. A king sitting in a place of great authority. So 46 times, every single time, it has this definition, this idea, this tone connected with it. Now, here's what's really significant. Out of the 46 times... This word is used every single time for Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. It is never recorded in the scriptures where Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father that this word isn't used every single time. Uh, let me give you some examples of that. Uh, just, I'm just trying to prove my point. Uh, Jesus has uh, uh, confronted the rich young ruler. And in confronting the rich young ruler, he goes running off. And then Jesus is so moved by this that he begins to talk about rich people and say that it's impossible for, getting into the, for to get them to get into the kingdom. It's just impossible. And his disciples are astonished and said, if that's true, if rich can't, people can't be saved, who then can be saved? And Jesus said, well, it's just a miracle that anybody is saved. With men, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. And then he moves on, and Peter says to him, Lord, we have left all and followed you. What are we going to get? And in verse 28 of chapter 19, Jesus says, listen to this, Assuredly, I say to you that in the regeneration, when the Son of Man sits, that word, on the throne of his glory, you, will have, you who have followed me also will sit, that word, on 12 thrones. Wow. This is all over the book of Hebrews. Let me just quote a couple of those for you. For instance, he starts the book of Hebrews by talking about Jesus. And in the third verse in the description of Jesus of verse chapter 1 he says Jesus being the brightness of his glory the expressed image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins sat down 
at the right hand of the majesty on high. That word right there, sat down. Jesus sitting at the right hand of the Father. In fact, in Hebrews chapter 8, he thunders, this is kind of the pivotal point of the book. He, he, he turns and says, now this is the main point. In other words, I've been hassling you for seven chapters. What, I've, what have I been hassling you with? This is what I've been trying to say. We have such a high priest who is seated. That's our word. <laughs> who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens. In the heavens. If you turn to Hebrews 10, 12. Wow. Listen to this one. But this man, Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down at the right hand of God. And we could just go on and on and on. They're just all. So every time, see, every time this word is used, this is significant, folks. Every time this word is used, it refers to a person of great authority sitting in a place of great authority. And within that cluster of 46, every single time Jesus sits at the right hand of the Father, it's recorded that he is sitting in his ascension. Wow. This is the word that's used. Now, back to Acts chapter, one, uh, chapter 2, verse 3. What is the significance of that in our, pa in our passage? Why would he use that word in relationship to the coming of the Holy Spirit? It's the most radical idea you've ever heard in your life. He is paralleling what's going on in the heavenly realms with what is now taking place in the earthly physical realms. What's going on in the heavenly realms? Jesus is sitting in authority, King of kings and Lord of lords, sitting at the right hand of the Father in the place of great authority. And the, can you see this? Jesus ascends and plops down at the right hand of the Father, sitting in the place of great authority. And the moment Jesus sits in the place of great authority, at that same time, the spirit of that Jesus descends to the earthly and sits on the believer in a place of authority. In heaven, there is a celebration going on and angels have gathered around and trumpets are blowing and Jesus is crowned King of kings and Lord of lords. At that very moment on the earthlies, the spirit of that Jesus is sitting on the believer and trumpets are blowing. Coronation service is being held. Anointing is taking place. Because the Spirit has come to reign as he sits on the believer. And a parallel is set up between what's going on up here, what's going on down here. Now, you realize, of course, that was a part of the prayer, the saturation. And we're going to be talking about that on Sunday morning sometime in, that Jesus gave in the Sermon on the Mount. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in. So whatever's going on up here is going to go on down here. And what's going on up here? Jesus is sitting in a place of great authority. The authoritative person of Christ is sitting in a place of authority. And at the time when he sits there, that takes place down here. His spirit is sitting in a place of authority. And the place of authority that he's sitting upon is the believer. And there is a parallel taking place. Now, <clears throat> why is that such a radical idea? It is a radical idea because it shifts. It determines, how to say this, it determines, it shapes, it gives you the perspective of what Jesus living within me is all about. 
Did I say that right? This concept, this reality, what he's trying to tell us is he's trying to shape what, how we will look at the fullness of the Spirit coming to be within us. What it, what, what it will mean, what, what the direction it takes, what the focus of it all is. Why would God send the essence of his personhood to sit on the believer? That, that determines the focus of the believer's life. In other words, it moves me from the focus of power to the focus of reigning. So the fullness of the Spirit is not, I got the power, brother. Sap. See, that's no longer the focus. The focus is, oh, he's sitting on me. I'm under his control. I'm dominated by his person. This was so important in the understanding of the wilderness temptation of Jesus. The first of the three, last, the first of the last three, at the end of the 40 days, the, there was three temptations that can't, took place in Jesus' life. One was the, the first one was the bread thing. The devil comes along and says, hey, since you're the son of God, why don't you take your power and zap those stones and turn them into bread and solve your problem? Since the Holy Spirit sits on you and you have all this power and you're going to move into a miracle ministry and you're going to do all this stuff and crowds are going to gather around you and since the Holy Spirit sits on you, the power of God sits on you, just zap those stones. But see, the difficulty is Jesus can't just do any miracle he wants to do. Because it's not his power, it's the power of the Spirit sitting on him. And he has no control over the power. Does that communicate? So it isn't like, see, I wish it were, folks. I wish, it, I wish God would give me the healing power and then I could charge 50 bucks a head. I mean, you know... You, gotta, you guys got to make a living. And I would heal the guys who pay me and I would not heal the guys who didn't pay me. See, I would heal Nazarenes, but hey, if you're not a Nazarene, just go someplace else. See, I'm not interested. See, I, because I got control over the power. But see, he doesn't give me the healing power as if it's mine and I have a right to it. He sits on me and he's in charge of it. And I have no idea who he's going to heal and who he's not going to heal. So this shifts the entire idea of this, 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 this focus, this, what this fullness of the spirit is all about. So obviously the focus, the, the sitting of the Spirit of God is not about, oh, I've got the gift. I've got the gift of interpretation. I've got the gift of healing. I've got the gift of, uh, of prophecy. I've got the gift and, now, and I can use the, no, you can't. In fact, I don't even have control over what gift I get. In fact, maybe he, see, it isn't like I study and find out what gift I've got and then I go out and use that gift. Could it be that the Spirit sits on me and at various times he gives me a different gift and I'm not even aware of it? To me, that makes perfect sense. For instance, I'm standing up here preaching and when I preach, a guy sits in the congregation and says, oh man, I've done things I shouldn't do. i have I feel so guilty. I ought to go to the altar, repent of my sin. And he runs to the altar and gets saved. <gasps> I got the gift of evangelism. Oh, praise the Lord. But in the same sermon, a guy sits out there and says, wow, that's a whole new idea to me. I never, I never even thought of that. Wow, that's, that's going to change my life. I've got the gift of wisdom. Oh. 
Oh, I thought you were, had the gift of evangelism. Well, at the same time, the gift of wisdom. See, can't God just sit on me and do what he wants to do? That's, that's this. So keep your little grubby hands off of it. Because you're coming under authority. Now, in that same idea, this sitting idea, and this, is, this, this leaps off of that, this sitting idea, again, we're talking about a person of great authority sitting in a place of great authority. And so as it happens up there, now it's happening down here, and the believer becomes the throne upon which the, the Spirit of God sits. That's the imagery. It's one thing for God to have power over me. <gasps> He's come to be over me. He's reigning over me. I'm under his control, just as we've all stated. That's one idea. It's another thing for the power of God to be from me. In other words, if he's sitting on me, the imagery is, if he's sitting on me, he does have authority over me. I got that. Let's take Jesus. He's sitting at the right hand of the Father, and he has this throne that he's sitting on. What's it like? Hey, you imagine it the way you want to. It's okay with me. Uh, it has uh, velvet cushions. It has a diamond stuck in, and it's gold plated on the arms. And uh, it's just the right size for Jesus, who's six foot tall with blue eyes. So he's sitting there. And suddenly Jesus says, you know, you guys didn't make this throne exactly right. Uh, the legs are too tall. My, my, my feet don't comfortably reach the ground. I want these legs cut off. So he gets up. The carpenters come in, slice off the legs. Why? He has the control over the throne that he sits on. Hey, the cushions are too. I don't like these cushions. Hey, get me some new cushions. And so we get him new cushions. Why? He has authority over the throne that he's sitting on. That makes sense. So if the Spirit comes and sits on me, he has authority over me. I got that. He's sitting on me, and he has authority over me. But another thing to say, he sits on the throne, and it's from the throne that he exerts his authority. Now, I know he has authority over me. But it's another thought that he's sitting on me and from the platform of my life, he is exerting his authority into my world. And I am simply the avenue, the platform, the throne that he's sitting on from which he does that. And ladies and gentlemen, that is a radical concept. See, if he just reigns over me, I'm just a throne that he has control over, cut the legs off. If he just reigns over me, that's an Old Testament concept that God is telling me what to do and I have to do it. But if he's reigning from me, then I become an avenue through which God literally flows his power into my world and literally changes my society. That's an altogether different concept. See, if he's just reigning over me, then, well, I've got to discipline myself and be what he wants. He wants short legs. Okay, I'll, I'll, I'll shrink down. See, I've got to discipline myself, bring myself under control, get it done, operate right, do what he tells me. See, it's a disciplined kind of thing. But if, it's, if he's not just reigning over me, if he's reigning from me, then wow. Well, the... Uh, this has always been intriguing me. The fruits of the Spirit. I've never memorized them. I know Nathan has. He's better than I am. But the last one is self-control. And we view that as self-controlling. Self-controls. That's a fruit of the Spirit. If it's a fruit of the Spirit, then it's not self-controlling. It's Spirit-controlling. 
So this, if he reigns over me, then I've got to control myself, get my act together. But if he's reigning from me, then literally I become an instrument through which he flows his divine discipline that puts it on an altogether different plane. Wow. See, if he's reigning over me, then I'm obligated. He's done so much for me. Jesus died for me. I know. He's building heaven for me. Oh, streets of gold. Man, I owe him big time. Okay, I'll have to go through this. And I come under his control. But see, if he's reigning from me, then I become a part of the expression of the heart of God so that people begin to see Jesus in my life. Now, I don't want you to get the wrong idea. See, I, I believe that he reigns over us. But this takes us, this concept takes us a step further. Now, uh, let me give you another aspect of that. Uh, I, I really believe in surrender. And I believe that everybody ought to surrender. And uh, let's all sing the song. Oh, I surrender all. Okay, that's enough. So surrender is important. I have no problem with that. I surrender. But I've, I've experienced that surrender normally focuses on things. Have you surrendered everything to Jesus? No, I've got one thing. One thing I've been holding out on. Well, give it up. One thing. Give it up. Okay, and I surrender my things. The difficulty with that is, what I've experienced is, that then after I surrender that one last thing, Jesus finds another thing. <laughs> okay, have you surrendered all to Jesus? No, I got one more thing, <laughs> one more thing. And so I come to the altar. That's why I come to the altar all the time, folks. One more thing, one more thing, one more thing, one more thing. And I found that is endless, people, in my life, that I'm continually finding one more thing. Now, that's him ruling over me. But see, this idea of him ruling from me moves us into a whole different dynamic. Not that this isn't true. It is true. But him ruling from me literally sets the whole tone to he, I, am, I am participating. My life is literally becoming a platform. I've become a, a, a dispenser. I'm, I'm literally a, a stage. My life is literally the, the means by which the divine God literally exerts his authority and power into my world. We're dealing with the word sat in verse 3. And the word sat is all, it's used 46 times in the New Testament, and it's not the normal word for sit, and it's the person of great authority sitting in a place of great authority, and it's the word that's always used for Jesus sitting at the right hand. Sits on his throne. And what he's, when he describes Pentecost, he says that the Spirit of God broke up and in, came into the room in the flame of fire thing and broke into pieces, and one piece sat and it uses this word. So as Jesus is, the imagery is, as Jesus is sitting at the right hand of the Father, now he is sitting on the believer. So Jesus ascends and sits, and at the same moment, the Spirit descended and sat. And as Jesus sat on his throne in the heavenlies, now the Spirit is sitting on the believer, and the believer has become the throne upon which the Spirit sits which means he has authority over the throne, but not just that. Hit the throne is the platform from which he exerts his authority into the world. So the believer becomes the platform for the authority movement, the, the power of God for the exertion of the authority into, uh, a, a, into his world. 
That's just a phenomenal concept. Now, uh, we've, on, we've got, hey, anybody want to say anything on that? Yes, sir. Uh, well, there is also the oh, we got it. Sorry about the telephone. Um, that word is also used in the previous sentence where the people came into where the people were sitting. Oh. Cathedral is, is, is also used there. wonder what the significance of that is. Uh, I think it still fits the definition. They were persons of great authority. Spiritually. Yeah, now they have become a position of great authority. These were the, this mm -hmm. was the... Um, so this is not your average, <coughs> your average deal, is it? No, this, <coughs> this is This fullness the of the spirit, this that's is for the, sure. This is the, the, the most spiritual people in the group. Yeah. This is a phenomenal, phenomenal concept. And, and when, I, when I try to visualize in my, in my mind and heart that when I, walk in, when I walk down the streets of Lebanon, I literally am the throne upon which the Spirit speaks and is exerting His power and authority into my world. I'm walking into Walmart and I'm exerting the authority of God into the Walmart scene. Come on, folks. The devil ought to be trembling. Yeah. See, you ought to say, oh, good night. Here they come. Not because we're hot. Not because we got some kind of big program. Not because we're so sharp. But, but because, and man, I crave this for the jail. To march into the jail and have the devil tremble and say, good night, Manly's walking in here again. Which he'd stay away. And folks, I hate the jail. I'd never go if I didn't have to. I promise you that. It's the last place in the world I want to step my foot. But to walk in there and be the throne upon which God sits to literally exert his authority, to come into the situation of hate and meanness. Can you, can you see you're, you're approaching a board meeting or an argument or somebody's all upset with you and they're getting in your face uh, 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 and you just march into that and the Holy Spirit which is sitting on you is going to exert his authority all over them. Oh, take that. Oh. <laughs> See, that's phenomenal. That's who we are. And that's, that's this imagery right here. And, and God, do, if you would go to your congregation where you attend and you would ask your congregation for, to describe where in their lives God is doing impossible stuff. Should we expect impossible things to be happening? And see, immediately... When somebody suggests that, you want to say something? Go ahead. Well, uh, on the word surrender, you indicate that it's about things. Also, the word surrender, in our language, strongly implies have to. You surrender because... There's a gun in my back. You. Yeah. Uh, Madame Guillaume likes the word abandon, and I do too. Yeah, that is a good word. But when we, we, when we talk about impossible things happening, should, see, if, 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 I'm, if I'm the throne and he sat on me, should I not expect impossible stuff to go on in my life? Well, how are you getting along? Well, it's hard, man. It's hard. Shouldn't I be saying, oh, whoa. <laughs> and I'm not talking about getting cocky. I'm not. But shouldn't we have... Don't we have an edge? <laughs> See, isn't there a plus factor going on in regard to us and our lives? And, and hey, we're, we're, we're winning. We're, we're, we, are, we are winning. We... Ah. 
And, uh, and again, when we think of impossible things, we again talk about, we think and immediately go to the miracles. And, and, and I'm, I'm not even talking about that. Uh, is it possible to love everybody? Well, no. I can tolerate everybody. I've got that one down. I can tolerate everybody. But loving everybody. In fact, I'm very, very careful about the word love. Uh, everybody says, oh, I love you, I love you, I love you. You know, you know I've heard that before. <laughs> See, I don't, I, and, and, and I'm, when, when I use the word love, I mean the word love. At least I want to. So loving everybody is really, again, I can tolerate. And so what I've done down at the church is I've developed this grit your teeth love thing. On Sunday morning, you walk in, I hate your guts. But glad you're here. And when you grit your teeth, you grin. See, I, 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 I've developed that well. But could he sit on me and change how I, could I feel about you the way he feels about you? See, that, that, that would be a miracle. Wouldn't that be a miracle? That would be a miracle. That would be an impo Hey, the whole holiness thing. Live without sin in your life. What? You've got to be crazy. That's impossible. Everybody messes up. And we run into that with our group. Uh, we have an addiction. And we do well for six months. And then, oh, well, they just slipped up a little. In fact, there was another uh, halfway house where uh, they had a program as well. And and one of their guys slipped up and, and overdosed. Well, he went to heaven. He, he loved Jesus and died of an overdose. Well, yeah, he, he wasn't perfect. Well, I don't want to put him in hell either. But is there victory here? Can you, come on. So have we dumbed down this idea, well, hey, everybody messes up. Nobody's what they really ought to be. And, and we're just, and so we've dumbed down. Uh, where I got this idea of dumbed down, a friend of mine who works in a factory, who managed, managed a factory, said it, it, it was a manufacturing term, this dumbing down. I said, well, what do you, what do you mean by it? He said, uh, you're making this product, and you always have quality uh, what do you call them? Control. Quality control. You have quality control. And the quality control people take the, take the, uh, the uh, product and they examine it to see if it meets the quality control. Well, it doesn't meet the quality control. Well, we got a problem. I know. So what are we going to do? Reduce the quality control. Oh, it meets the quality control now. What'd you do? You dumb down. So have we done that in Christianity? See, we've dumbed down. Here's what a Christian, well, we can't meet that. Well, well, how about? See, I don't think this allows us to do that. I think this is God sitting on us and we've become a platform from which his power and we ought to be expecting impossible stuff. See, I'd like to see, oh man, I'd like to see revival hit Lebanon, but I'd really like to see it hit Lebanon through the jail. Can you imagine revival coming to the jail and person after person after person just getting saved and filled with the Spirit and literally the Spirit of God sits on every one of them and you got 400 people in Wilson County Jail who are suddenly burning for God. <laughs> you know what that would do to our town? They'd spill out of there, brother. Because to tell you the truth, I don't think it's going to come from the Baptist church. I don't think it's going to come from the Methodist church. I don't think it's going to come from the, from the 
Nazarene church, the first church of the Nazarene, I don't think, I think we're all too middle, upper middle class, sophisticated, good old boys. I think it's going to take a bunch of, wow. Yes, sir. Talk to me. Just to, uh, maybe just affirm that, William Booth <clears throat> said that the reason the Salvation Army had such a grand impact in the early days, they've gone unhealthy now, but in the early days, the reason it was so sweeping and, and thousands and thousands were coming to Christ is because William Booth said, if you go into a town, find the worst sinner, save that one person and the rest of the town will come to Christ. <laughs> because if, if, the, if the town sees that God can save that one guy, surely he can do it in my life, which is the Joe idea. It's beautiful. Well, yeah, that's, that's good, brother. Whew. I've probably harassed you enough with this, but uh, wow, this, this is a great, this is the imagery, the content and the imagery he uses for the fullness of the spirit, the sound and the sitting, that he's sitting on you and that I am literally the throne from which the Holy Spirit is going to exert his authority. And you see that in the book of Acts, they just spell out and exert the authority of God. And, of course, this we could talk about the declaration thing. We could talk about, hey, I stand on my feet and I declare. Well, you got to be awful careful about whether that declaration is coming from the throne or coming from the person who's sitting on the throne. <laughs> Uh, one of the songs that I had real difficulty with is the song uh, that uh, I, I march into the enemy's camp and take back what he stole from me. Take back what he... See, I, I don't think I'm going to march any place and take anything back from anybody. <laughs> See, I think there's this sitting thing <clears throat> that means I'm going to cling to him and whatever he wants to do in this thing, I'm, I'm, I'm going to hide. <laughs> I'm going to hide in his embrace. And yeah, he marches in. Yeah, he takes back territory. Yeah, he pushes the devil back. But I'm, 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 I'm the little kid who's hiding behind his dad's big leg saying, oh, get him, dad. <laughs> uh, hey, let me pray with you. The Lord, we love you. Mm. <clears throat> In the name of Jesus, strip from my life anything that would take any kind of uh, credit or claim any kind of fame or would grab a hold of any kind of uh, applause or would want any kind of uh, admiration but would only look to you. And the, the phrase would give all the glory to God would not be some kind of trite spiritual thing to say. It would be the reality of my heart. Because I know this boy. I know the weakness of his life. I know the helplessness of my inner being. I know that if you don't sit on me and exert your authority from this platform of my weakness. If I don't have a treasure in the, in the, in the broken vessel, I, I, I'm lost, God. I'm lost. So I'm expecting, in the name of Jesus, I'm expecting uh, miracles. I'm expecting uh, powerful things. I'm expecting impossible stuff to happen around here. And you've already done that. He brought a work and witness team. It was impossible. We never would get that crazy building done. And you brought impossible stuff begin to happen that you've just worked out that couldn't be explained except you just moved. And we rejoice in all of it. And what you're going to do in these days ahead keeps us on the edge of our seat, rejoicing in the power of your person. So bless us uh, in the service tonight. In Jesus' name, amen.